back board, if you could please all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any citizen statements or petitions? And I don't have any correspondence, so let's move right into uh, item four, which is uh, appointment of a part-time administrative assistant. I think Amy, our Council on Aging Director, is City Center Director is here. Come on up. Ed Navira, our co-chair, is here as well. Hi. And I think Jennifer, is Jennifer on? Yes, Jennifer, Jennifer's on. Um, I'd like to just thank Jennifer um, O'Neill, our HR coordinator, and um, Earl Perlman, PEG's co-chair for the Council on Aging, for um, interviewing do, doing all the interviews that we did. Um, and I'm glad we, you know, we took our due, due diligence to find the right person. And um, the person that we have um, chosen is Julie Tolacro from um, Menden, from 11 Bellingham Street. Um, she's got a really good um, background in customer service, office management, um, operations, and I think she's really going to be a nice fit for for our department and a very welcome fit. Yeah, for, for you, our department. Yes. So, all right, great. And uh, I think uh, Jenna, you on? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you now. Um, do you have their, her, the rate of pay and anything else that the select board might need? That should all be in the motion, I believe, but it's at 21 for up to 18 hours per week. Yeah. It's actually in the packet. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I, we have it. Okay. Wonderful. And I, I just want to say that um, I was able to work with Amy on this. We had multiple um, applicants we interviewed, I believe five candidates and and uh you know out of all of them julie was definitely you know the top candidate and i'm, I'm confident that she's going to do well all right i'd be looking for a motion i move to appoint julie Tulacro to the part-time administrative assistant position at the coa at a rate of 21 dollars per hour for up to 18 hours per week Second. all right any discussion all those in favor Aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. May I just say I want to thank my council board members, um, the senior workers, and the volunteers at the center for helping us get through these last three months because it's, it can be a hectic place to be, and, and the board was wonderful just stepping up. Well, we always do. That's our job. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. I know the next motion is for uh, Christina Campbell, who we recently appointed to the historical commission also wanted to be on the local historic district commission i don't know if anybody else is there or david if anybody else wants to speak to that beyond that otherwise i'd just be looking looking for a motion to uh, appoint the recent appointee to the historic district commission as well i move to appoint christina campbell to the local historic district commission for a term to expire on 6 30 2024. second any discussion all those in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, let's let's move to uh, to Article Nine. The police chief. We'll do that one first. Chief Kersey. <laughs> I was going to say I I know his voice. You won't see. I've never heard him whine, but that is definitely not him. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so that article, uh, not article, that uh, that agenda item is to appoint William Kessler, the retired fire chief, as a traffic constable. This is something new. That's what post. Um, it's a civilian position um, that we're allowed to backfill after we use all union employees um, for details. Uh, he'll go to training for that. He's already taken our certificate class, um, and he'll be under our, our regulations and rules and policies. All right. Thanks, Chief. Nobody has any questions. I just look be looking for a motion. I move to appoint William Kessler to the position of traffic constable for the Menden Police Department. Second. All right. Motion made and second. If there's no discussion, I 
All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. All right. Let's. Um, I just invite up the, the fire chief. I know we have a few, uh, few appointments and then a discussion. So first person I want to call up is Christian Drella. <laughs> So I'm looking to appoint Christian to the career firefighter paramedic position. Uh, we had a recent vacancy. We interviewed 12, or we received 12 applicants. We interviewed five. Christian came out on top. Um, the panel was four individuals, two lieutenants, a firefighter, and an outside fire officer. They conducted the interviews, and like I said, Christian came out of the interview with the, the board's choosing for the position. Uh, Christian is a certified paramedic, firefighter one, two, second generation firefighter. His father who's in the audience is a lieutenant in Saugus and his brother is a firefighter paramedic with us actually. Um, he recently obtained his firefighter one, two through Weston fire. Um, he was a per diem firefighter with us up until 2022 uh, per diem EMT filling in the vacancies. Um, he's also worked at Cataldo Ambulance in Malden, and as I said, Weston. So I'm looking to appoint him to the career firefighters paramedic position. Okay, so you're so you're a trained paramedic, yes, and we're going to have you and your brother as paramedics both. Yes, sir. Here, yeah. well, that's terrific. Thank you for thank you for applying, and um, we wish you luck. But I'd be looking for for a motion, <clears throat> number eight. I move to appoint Kirsten Jolla to the position of career firefighter paramedic for the Menden Fire Department at a rate of $27.83 per hour. Second. All right. Anybody have any? Just, I just want to confirm this is filling back filling an open position. It is an open yeah. position. We had a firefighter leave to go to another department in the end of last year. All right. No other discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Next person I'm going to call up is Kyle Marcinkwitz. Did I pronounce it right? Yes, you did. <laughs> Learned how to spell it, so well. So, looking to appoint Kyle to the department as a on-call firefighter paramedic. Kyle applied in October. It's been a lengthy process to get him through. Uh, he's passed all the pre-hire requirements, including the background check and the physical. He is a career lieutenant in Ashland and a resident of Bellingham. He has strong ties to Menden through his mother-in-law. Um, he's a paramedic. He's looking to help out with the ambulance. He can backfill shifts with us as a paramedic, which we're low on paramedics, so that'll be That's terrific. a great help. He has 13 years of experience in the fire service. He started actually as a fire explorer, so I'm looking to get him on to help with that program great. as well. Uh, he's fire one and two, fire instructor, fire officer one, two, three, he has multiple NIMS ICS qualifications, bachelor's degree in fire science, and currently in the master's program for a public administration. Just Impressive. Yeah, yeah very. That's great. Pretty good recruitment yeah. skills, I think. <laughs> Just same question. These are all budget neutral. All these appointments are Yeah, this make. is for the call. Our call department is low in numbers right now, so we're looking to build that up. So I'd be looking for a motion uh, under number eight, six. I'm sorry, number six. They don't want to make the motion because the pronunciation of the last name <laughs> is tough. I've been here. I, I, I know how you feel. I move to appoint Kyle Marcinkowitz Perfect. to the position of on-call firefighter for the Menden Fire Department at a rate of sixteen fifty-seven per hour with an annual stipend of $500. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. So the next one is Peter Ostrowski Jr. Peter, if you want to come up. So Peter applied to the department to be an on-call firefighter paramedic, certified paramedic as well. Um, he's successfully completed all the pre-hire requirements, including the background check and the physical. 
He's been a firefighter in Concord since 2012. He is currently a lieutenant there where he was promoted in 2021. He also serves as the EMS coordinator and is a member of the District 14 Tech Rescue Team. So Peter and I go back a little bit. Um, he grew up in the fire service. He started as a call firefighter in Oxbridge in 2008. Before that, I had the pleasure of being one of the mentors during a internship program when he was in high school, when my time in Oxbridge. Uh, he was a instructor at the Mass Fire Academy from 2017 to 2022. So I'm looking to use him for that capacity as well. Uh, he is also a paramedic and wants to work on shifts as well. So that'll great help us in that capacity. He is certified firefighter one, two, fire instructor one, two, fire officer one, two, and a rope rescue technician and has a bachelor's degree in fire science. So I'm looking to put Peter on as a on-call captain. This will fill the void from the deputy position that I vacated. Sure. He'll take on my capacity overseeing the call department and helping with training. Great. Does anybody have any questions? So an impressive resume. Right. Yeah. It's fantastic. I could have a, a motion. I move to appoint Peter Oshrowski Jr. to the position of on-call captain for the Menden Fire Department at a rate of $18.67 per hour with an annual stipend of $1,500. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I have to say I do approve everybody's hairstyle too. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Congratulations. Now the next uh, issue has to do with the, the appointing, appointing authority, right? Correct. Yeah. So I reached out to Chairman Moroli about a month ago, requesting to get authorization to appoint on call and per diem firefighter EMTs and paramedics to the department. Chief Kessler had a similar setup that was approved in 2020. He worked with the town administrator to approve the appointment of on call personnel. Uh, I was asked to come describe the difference between strong chief and weak chief because in 2017, the town meeting voted to remove the strong chief law. And if I can just, j just for everybody's edification, at the time um, our police chief was a fire chief, was, was untrained as a fire chief, and actually initiated that with the idea that someday that we would probably reverse the decision once we had somebody such as our current uh, chief. And if I'm incorrect, please point it out to me. Uh, yeah, that, that was, um, Chairman, that was a, a board decision. It was uh, the whole board of select, but I had nothing to do with it except helping them out with it. I just assisted. So it was uh, a board decision. So he asked me to come in and just give a little history about the strong chief first. Weak chief, uh, March 9th, 1951, the town adopted Mass General Law 48, Section 42, which is the so-called strong chief law, as well as Section 43, which is the force warden. Section 42 states that the Select board establishes a fire department under the direction of a fire chief, which is appointed by the board. This gives the appointing appointed chief the authority over the administration of the department. This does not exclude the board, though. It does, within the law, states that the fire chief can be removed with a hearing. The fire chief shall report to the board time to time and annually on the condition of the department. So like I said, in 2017, that town meeting, it was removed with a voice majority of 134 people at the meeting. In the same meeting, Section 42A, which is the so-called weak chief, was adopted. This law establishes a fire department under the direction of the select board who appoints a fire chief and other officers and firemen as they deem necessary. The law also states that the select board makes the suitable regulations governing the fire department and the firemen and may be removed by the chief and other officers at their pleasure. In November that same year, there was a bylaw created that changed the last part of it with the regulations. It changed it so the fire chief submits to the board and after 30 days, it would go into effect if no action was taken. So essentially the adoption of the law 
places full control of the the fire department under the select board and basically leaves the fire chief as the supervisor of the department, but everything runs through the board, including discipline, policy, everything from hiring to firing. So what I was looking for tonight is just the authority to appoint on call firefighters and EMTs. I worded it as non-career members. I figured that would encompass everyone in that. Mm -hmm. I just want to be sure the, the way that it was voted by a previous board was to authorize you as the fire chief to appoint on call and per diem fire personnel. Is that correct? So the previous one, it was an agreement between Chief Kessler and the town uh, administrator. Town administrator. That was <laughs> because the way the motion the town is town administrator would appoint when requested by the fire chief. And that's what you want to do is keep it that way. That would be what I would look for. In other I, words, you're just continuing the existing policy. Correct. Yeah. So I'm not even sure we even need a motion to continue, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Um, the way it was described to me was it was an agreement between Chief Kessler and the town administrator at the time. Right. <coughs> Unclear if it's and if it continues on. And is there a is there a distinction between filling an existing on call position and creating a new position? Because that would be because obviously uh, Mike, Mike has questioned about, you know, budget issues and yeah. increasing the size of the department. I would I would have a concern or. We need to obviously stay within the budget. Yep. So if Absolutely. there's a certain defined amount mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of backfilling vacant positions yep. um, versus creating new positions that might be problematic. Yeah, I mean, it feels that the practical implication of this motion is to actually eliminate the need to do what we just did. Correct. You do that. Yep. With and like I TA. Said. Yep. And not be held up by our correct a quorum. The right. two on call right. firefighters yes. could have been a point. They were yes. good so, to go in December. Yeah, and so even in my mind, the TA would be the the regulator from a budget. They would ask the questions I yep. just asked. Right. You know. Right. As a matter of fact, I would uh, the discussion we had when we were talking about putting this on the agenda was I wasn't even certain we needed to, but anytime we have an opportunity to recognize anybody, I think it's great. Yeah. Um, but. Um, I would just request that we just keep it the way that it is and I look for a motion just as it's written here. I move to authorize the town administrator to appoint on call and per diem fire personnel when requested by uh, Fire Chief Bagman. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay. All right, sir. Thank you very much. All right. You know, like I think we probably need to make that motion just if it was specific to Fire Chief Kessler. We probably needed to make this, you know what I mean? Because it's very specific, but yeah, we're all set. Well, like I said, when we discussed it, I wasn't certain. And I just, what I figured was better safe. Right. Yeah. Right. The, the fire chief had approached me uh, about doing making the appointment. And I deferred to the board. The board could actually probably make a decision about that. And that's how that whole thing ended up in the agenda. I talked to Mike about it, I believe. And, right. And uh, we just wanted to confirm the fact that we're going to continue that policy moving into the future. I mean, Mike, <coughs> frankly, the rest, rest of the story is, um, you know, there were reasons at the time, I, I believe, to, cr to switch from a strong chief to a weak chief. Um, but I'm not, um, I'm not, I, I, I feel pretty strongly that we probably should revert back to the way it was before 2017 and, and give the, the fire chief, the strong chief authority again. Um, but it wouldn't be us, it would be town meeting, right? But um, that's a discussion for another day, you know, but just to bring it up. All right, so. Uh, Providence Street Engineering Construction and Funding Sources. I know that uh, I talked with the highway surveyor and there he is. Um, have you caught up in your sleep at all? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. So uh, what, can you can we just start by you just giving us a recap of the Providence Street and what DOT suggested and... and uh, so, so I had that DOT come out again last week to uh, look at the 
flooding that happened for the second time and they deem the road safe. Uh, this time he did say to me that he is recommending that we look into doing a box culvert system, which um, is basically a concrete box that's going to go under the road. It's going to help with the structure of the road and the traffic that's going through there. It would be a lot stronger than putting pipes under the road. Um, so moving forward, I had met with David last week and reached out to Graves Engineering to see if it was something because they're already on contract with the town, whether they would come out to do the engineering. They got back to me and said they would not. Um, I talked to Ty and Bond, which we're on contract with for all of our stormwater, uh, the stormwater task force, and they're going to come out Friday to assess the the uh, Providence Road area and they have said that they can pretty much do the whole thing from engineering straight through to to putting it out to bid and getting bids in for us so i'm going to have more of a discussion with them on friday when they come out to review the site but as of right now that's where we stand and we need i'm trying to work on first the engineering portion of this Okay, I know I was on a call this week for, um, you know, for the for the rural areas of the state that that uh, it's a weekly it's a weekly call, and there were conversations about e even though there's been discussions about um, reducing some of the earmarks that the that the governor did because of a, a drop in revenue, there's also new monies being made available to do various infrastructure projects like this, so. Um, I mean, there's there's definitely all kinds of options out there because one of the responses that I got back from Ty and Bond today was talking about um, this could actually fall into an environmental resources grant because of the habitat that is in that that waterway, and we potentially could get grant money to fix it through that. Is is there any habitat left after the water went over the road? <laughs> that I don't know, but uh, they're they're. Um, senior project manager is in on this conversation and he's going to be out here Friday and he's the one that talked about this Springbrook could be a competitive site for the that environmental grant because of priority priority habitats nearby and a cold water fishery resource. So there are definitely options out there to get the funding to have this to have this replaced. Has there been any discussion discussions at all about what the cause of this besides just changing weather patterns? Was there anything mentioned about a change upstream that created this issue? There was there was a conversation about seeing if uh, there's a beaver dam upstream, which we can look, but I, I'm, I'm, this is my opinion is just the amount of water we've had and the condition of the two pipes going under that road is what caused this. We were out monitoring it on Saturday morning and we got to about a foot and a half from going over the road before the rain stopped and the water started to recede. And that's, I think that's just, that was two inches of rain. I think just the pipes are in such poor condition now that they can't handle a, any decent amount of water. So are they blocked or collapsed or? One of them is uh, collapsed and one of them is partially blocked. Do you have a, a time frame in mind? Did they say how long before? They didn't, and I kind of, I, I kind of have. I know we talked about uh, the state funding for a small bridge, but we're talking end of summer, early fall before the project happens. And I, I honestly, with the given given the weather patterns that we've had, I don't think we can wait that long. We're just going to keep running into where we have to close roads, close that road, and close that road because it flooded again. And I think that's something we need to look into as the town and how we're going to handle fixing this and how quickly we can get it done. I, I know one of the one of the conversations, the meeting I was on was talking about reimbursement after money is spent. Um, but, you, you know, there's a procurement process and you, you mentioned to me that the DOT said that this is actually something that your crew could potentially do because of these precast um, type of type he didn't of mention it i mentioned looking into seeing if it was something that our crew could handle 
uh, but it's at a minimum, it still needs to be engineered and done the correct way. Sure, of course. I originally so thought I think that's where we're going to we're going to start with the engineering portion of it to see what they recommend and hopefully maybe we can do it as the highway department as opposed to having it go out to bid. But they, they I need to see the engineering first so that we can get a grasp on it. Do, do you know if the these box culverts are precast and dropped in a place or are they poured in place? Do you know they're precast and dropped into place? They usually come in six or eight foot sections and you can get them as big as you i think the biggest site you can get is up to 12 foot by 12 foot which we wouldn't that'd be too big for that area i think we need to think about maybe 12 feet wide and eight feet tall because 12 feet high would be too much for the road we did and i think we're going to hit lead we really have to dig down So you and David will work on the the funding and and get back to us. I guess a couple of questions. One is, did they give you an estimate of what the engineering cost would be? They did, and that's what that's. They're going to give us that estimate once they come out and actually look at the job that needs to be done on Friday. Uh, what time on Friday? Just uh, nine a.m. Right. And this, they're this gonna be the they're gonna... You'd have to follow the procurement laws on this, correct? We will have to follow procurement. We'll have to figure that out and just in terms of timeline. OK, I just want to maybe revisit what we talked about in our last meeting. Um, so we've talked about using ARPA funds for highway. Sure. I mean, I'd like to re revisit the idea of earmarking our remaining ARPA funds. Give highway a chunk of money that we know we have doesn't mean that we're going to not go after the grants, John. But it would give you a set sum of money you know is available for your pavement study, your culvert work, whatever you deem to be the priority. And that way he's, he can move forward with an idea that funding source is available. Does that make sense? Sure. That's our, but that's, I think that's part of 18, right? Um, Capital plan ad hoc. Group no, on. I think, well, I think what I'm saying is I'm moving, in a, I mean, it could be, but I think. It, so I'm a process guy, and I've made a point of following process in a number of meetings, but I also think that process can also get in the way. I mean, I think the ARPA funds can only be used for certain things, right? And I, and if we commit to a certain dollar amount to highway and, and the other project that was the senior center, it doesn't mean it has to stay there. You can move that money back. You could put it all the highway down the road. You could put you know, 25 percent to highway now add to it later. I mean, well, we've already and we've already done some of that with a fire right. truck. And other things. I'm just saying right now, right. given the um, what I'm hearing is the priority that John's putting forth on the need to get this thing fixed sooner than later. We do have a pavement study. I don't think it's <laughs> going to be any secret that we want to put more money towards roads this year. We need to. I'm just saying let's let's move the let, let's I'm saying make a decision now. Let's move, move, move some to highway. At least John knows there's some besides the uh, chapter 90 funds. He's got another chunk of change I, he can plan around. I, I'm not going to use chapter 90 for the Providence Road. Well, I'm just saying chapter 90 in general for pa the pavement. Oh, stuff oh too. for the paving. Yeah, but, but but I think the important issue is you have you had this group coming out on Friday. I think we should put it on the agenda for two months, two weeks from now. And then we have a, a better idea of what we're going to need for this. And also, there's also a, a short time frame to find out about other available funds. Yeah, and I don't. I don't yeah. disagree. So there's not for, there's for a highway. just maybe not for this project because there may be other funds available. Well, I, I, I look at it this: if if if, he, if we bank it, he can either tap it if he needs to, if it's an emergency, while he's pursuing funding, whether it be reimbursement or not. I'm saying, I, John, I'm not, and David, I'm not saying do not pursue grants on this. I mean, we saw some, uh, Jason had sent that, forwarded that email. Right. Yeah. Specific to culvert work, which I think David's attending a, a And that's what I'm on. talking about, too. On the 23rd. Yeah. This decision doesn't preclude pursuing those funds. All I'm saying is, we're, all I'm saying is I want to move some money into highway that John can plan around, whether it be the pavement study, the culvert work, one or many culverts. I think there's other places that John's mentioned might need some work. Sure, but I just want to say, 
he's got to put his plan together. We can at least give him a baseline foundation of dollars he can kind of look at and say, I know I have this. I might get more, but to start my plan, let's, you know, give him something to work with. That's all. And we can wait two weeks or the first week in February. I'm just saying I'm more of a why wait right now with the opera fund because I think there's some good projects out there that we can earmark, not spend, but at least give folks the money to know they got some planning they can do around it. Uh, the engineering is going to take some time, I would think, probably four to six weeks. No? Yeah. I will have a better idea of talking to them on Friday. All right. This no, I'll, be, the last, I'll be there for that. This, let's let's target kind of a, February 7th. Yeah, for February, let's target for February 7th. And I, I'd like to to check with finance too, to talk with Jody in, in the budget. And let's let's actually come up with a plan and not just earmark maybe that, but let's look at the rest of the ARPA funds and where we want to commit it with knowing that there, there needs to be a piece. I, I think it's, it's urgent. It's beyond urgent to... To deal with highway but if you're using other funds other than ARPA you're gonna you're gonna have to tap into either free cash capital stabilization or something along that line and you're gonna need a town meeting to do that so you know right. regardless if you if you're not using the ARPA funds up front then we're gonna have to plan to have a special town meeting just to address that whole issue we visit on number 18. yeah right and also we're gonna we're going to actually um, open the the ATM warrant tonight. We have Jody. Can I can I ask you? I think we had over three hundred thousand in free cash that we didn't designate at the special, right? I don't have that number. All right, but that's yeah. well, that's yeah, ballpark. Ballpark. Right. that's my it's my ballpark. It's it's yeah. it's. It sounds about right. Yeah. So so the, and, and again, we didn't do anything with it, but we certainly can at the ATM. So there's. There's a, I guess all I'm getting at is we have a lot of different sources from different places, and I think we can take a two or three week period to, to get a sort better, you know, better idea and then make a decision to earmark it on the 7th. Yeah. Has anyone spoken to Mass DOT? Yes. Okay. They were actually out, like he said, they were actually out, they've been out twice, and he has another meeting with them on, on Friday. 25 years ago, we had an opportunity for Mass DOT to do the complete Providence Street reconstruction. Mm -hmm. The only reason it didn't happen is because we couldn't get a unanimous vote of the Board of Selectmen at the time. I was on that board. We had hearings. We did everything. We're all set to go. And one of the selectmen said no. And Mass DOT said we need a unanimous vote. And that's why we lost it. And that well, was a $300,000 job at the time. At the time. Yes. 25 years ago. So that's about 25 years. Ago. It's about a million and a half now. Yes. Right. And all we had to cover was the engineering fees. I, I, I think I remember that. Remember that? I think so because I, I think my, my father was talking about it. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Which would be, and usually when he said something, I remembered it, yeah. you know, right. So, all right. Well, th thank you for that. Um, Anything else on this subject? I'll take that as a no. Let's um, let's move on to uh, plowing private ways. I'm not sure that we really actually at this point need to address this because if you look at the materials, my original question was whether it had been accepted, the acceptance statute had been approved and come to find out it had been, uh, I believe back in the 60s or the 70s. Right. Uh, John did file a memo with us, I believe in October, yeah, which designated the roads uh, that we were going to plow as well as the roads we weren't going to plow. So the issue has sort of resolved itself in the couple of weeks since this whole thing was brought up. I just I think the other thing I just want to revisit um, because we discussed it in the last year or two was there was a discussion at one point about using public funds to uh, yeah. repair or fix a couple of private roads. And, you know, when I was at the MMA conference last year, it was made very clear to me that that was something that we could not do unless there was some kind of a betterment that was charged for all of the of the owners 
of the land on the private way. And that has and, to be done by bylaw. Yeah, Gene, if I can, yeah, yeah, go ahead and, and please enlighten us again. So it's um, against the law to do any kind of repairs to private ways because the law says you cannot spend public funds on private things, except in this case, you can create a bylaw, which of course gets accepted by the townspeople. And that would spell out, and these would just be small temporary repairs, but you can also speak in that bylaw about who gets assessed for those repairs. If you don't have that bylaw, I think it's probably, if, if indeed we need to make those kind of repairs, then I suggest you look into the bylaw. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that there was something that, that um, the town actually voted to accept a law, I mean, decades ago that gave us the authority, gave the town the authority to, uh, and it could be just, you know, on an emergency basis when the, when the uh, fire or police have to respond. But I know there's a way that we've been doing it legally. And it repairs? Um, well, it says, uh, Master General Law 40 Section 6C to plow and sand private waves yeah, accepted by the town. town. That's strictly plowing and sanding. Yeah, the right. Of, the line of, there is. Repairs. Right. The line above that says, 40 section 6F repairs yes. to private roads. Right. So and that that's referenced right? in yeah. the package. 40 also. section 6F was voted and accepted um, on March 26, 1965 by the town to allow repairs to private roads. So that's um, the, that's the an appendix of mass general laws voted by the town. The law, the law, and in, in reading it regarding the public ways and the plowing, uh, mentioned the fact that you could do temporary repairs on private ways as long as they're not permanent. So you can expend funds if it's a public safety hazard, but you can't do permanent fixes to private roads. Yeah, the I way can research that a little bit further if you'd like. I don't think I don't think you need to just because. And, and again, I just want to kind of reiterate it that uh, the, the town had voted that we could do, like you said, temporary repairs, fill potholes and things and plow and sand to keep it passable for emergency vehicles. But any um, improvement to the road, permanent improvement or recon reconstruction of it to, you know, to, to Gene's point was that that would have to involve a betterment to the road and uh, all of the owners of the roadway would have to agree to it. And then they would be charged an abetment or added on to their property taxes to pay for it. And I think the last time that happened was what, 25 years ago and they didn't want to. Isn't that correct? What we did, Kinsley Lane had come before us when I was on the board again. And um, that's how I did a lot of research into it. And at that point we advised them to create a association and collect from all the people on the street to do their own repairs. And that's how it was set up. And then, I, of course, a long time ago, I don't know if they've kept that up, but I, I, I'll be interested in looking at that law that we accepted because all the laws I looked at says that the municipality can't do any kind of repairs. Okay, well this, again, I'm just, this was the, the uh, our admin provided this as a list of votes. So the town did vote in 1965 to allow some kind of repairs, um, although it's pr certainly abbreviated. We can look it up the chapter and section and see what it says. Because, and I do know that I, I'm pretty sure our, our current uh, council, Karis North, actually cited that at an M at the MMA conference last year. Yep. Oh, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, I, I just looked up that law. I, I don't mean to just jump in here, but um, the town took action and added this in in 65. That law was repealed in 77. Okay. Um, so we might need to update the reference to that law if it has moved in Massachusetts general law. Um, so that's not the right section, at least. Yeah, well, it could be it could be wrong. It also could be that. Yeah, that there's some other law that was passed and we'll, right. find, we'll have we'll have council check on it. Yeah, and we can we can that's change that at town meeting. Right. All right. Anything else on? Uh, I, th I think we we pretty much covered that pretty. So we're researching what our responsibilities are, what we're willing to do in terms of well, allowing I, repairing private ways. Well, I, I think at the at the moment we've, you know, we, we, we know that we can, that, that the highway department can continue to plow and sand private ways because we def defined it and, and voted on yeah. it. 
but at the same time, we need to look into if, if they can do anything more than emergency repairs or if they even can do emergency repairs. I will say while we're talking about this though, um, uh, we, we did a little bit further research on the hot box. And it turns out that the hot box is scheduled on our uh, on our insurance policy, and it, and it, I, I spoke with somebody at at our insurance pol at our, uh, at Maya, and uh, we've opened a uh, a separate new claim for the hot box, and we do have rental, and they are assigning an appraiser to come out and look at it. It's listed on actual cash value, um, and I don't know what the what the uh, depreciation schedule is, but. Um, the point is that the process is moving forward to actually get it replaced under insurance. So, which certainly at, 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 as a point in the future, you might want to take a look at all the insurance policies and to make sure they're not ACV actual cash value, but rather replacement costs. Because if you have a, uh, a piece of equipment and it depreciates over a period of 15 years, gets hit, they're not going to give you the full cost to replace that vehicle. Well, the cost it costs more to do the replacement cost, but it protects our interests better. Yep. Well, the the, the issue is um, if they even will give you replacement cost versus ACV. You know, sometimes um, I don't know what Meyer will do. It's probably more important on buildings. You know, and, and things like big ticket items versus a hot box. Right. Well, again, so like I said, a, it's, you don't it's, want to get a surprise after the fact and find out that no, a building just, has been damaged and they're not going to pay you to replace the building. Right. It's like I said, it's just based on, you know, what what pol what 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 policy they'll write. Sometimes yeah. they won't give you. Um, Replacement cost. No, I get that. Yeah. Yep. I was a, I was that was, I was an underwriter in a prior life. So. Yep. All right. Welcome, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, I have a very comprehensive legal opinion on private ways from the town of Arlington that I'll share with you. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to 13 uh, discussion of the Maple Street. I know that there was a presentation made about three different options after our meeting. Can we bring up the PowerPoint? Yep, I will do that right now. I think I'm just going to paraphrase that they did th three different options. And uh, ultimately, the option um, really, the, the, the breakdown for Maple Street is there's going to be their recommendation um, that makes the, the most sense and um, is the safest and minimizes the delay to traffic is where they will put uh, a traffic light at Maple Street where the vehicles will come up and basically turn to a right angle so that they're facing directly across the street. And at the, when the light changes, they'll either be able to take a left and go west on 16 or take a right and go east on 16. And then uh, traffic headed east on Route 16 um, will be able to, to be a right and go down Maple Street. So this is a, an additional traffic light from the original proposal, is that? I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's this an addition. Their original. Yeah, proposal. I think that was the original okay. proposal. What they okay. did was um, they were able to um, review it and they did minimize the amount of uh, land, trees and sidewalk and everything else that they're going to take um, so that the abutters in the area would would be minimally impacted. And at the same time, uh, you know, they're still going to reconstruct um, the intersection at Main and Route 16 and North Ave. So the traffic coming up Main Street, uh, there'll be a bike path, uh, a bike turn lane, but then there'll also be um, a lane that will go a left turn lane and then a straight and right turn lane. And right now that that extra little right turn that goes into the into the DB Mart, that, that's going to be eliminated, but that whole area is going to be widened uh, to basically 
relieve some of the congestion. So, and they did this additional study based on our asks to say, can you make Maple Street one way, things like that. So there are other configurations that were being asked. So they took it back, reviewed all three options and came back with a recommendation of the initial, the, the prior traffic. And you can see it's pretty comprehensive. I mean, there's, there's, you know, traffic counts. They, they did a whole nother traffic study and you can see the intersection. There is one, one picture here. If you go to uh, this, you know, it's, it's with Charles River Bank and Founders Park. I think you have that picture if you can. Oh, okay. Uh, do you know what page it's on? It's on? Looks like uh, probably six or seven. I think the, the you know this is on the agenda just to make sure that everyone on the board has a chance to see it. Yeah. Right. You know, if you're and then also there is it's also um, we we were asked to uh, to make a motion um, just to uh, you know approve their recommendation of alternative one. Yep. It's important. It's important to note also the police, the police chief, fire chief, um, highway superintendent Mike Goddard. Uh, Joyce Gilmore all participated in that meeting. So, and the general conclusion was that option was, one was the best choice. And we peppered them with questions. Okay. So they answered them all very, with sound sound logic, I think. This is the slide that drives it home most for me. It's the, uh, the average queue length, yep. you know, for the different options at right. peak hour, showing that one is quite a bit lower than the others. So unless there's any any further discussion, I'd just be looking for a motion to approve the alternative one. I move to approve alternative one for Route 16 at Main Street, North Avenue intersection, and Route 16 at Maple Street intersection as recommended by MassDOT. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thanks very much. Uh, number 14, solar agreements. C can you step up, Jody, and... Gene. <laughs> so I just have it on here as solar agreements. I know we, Jody, I know you and I talked briefly about it in. I guess that the is is it partly the, the question of of uh, reassessing the value of it with the uh, with the in, in light of the pilot agreement or I don't recall speaking with you about the solar agreements as to this agenda, um, but I'm happy to talk about what we have done. Great, um, Dylan. Actually, I thought this was on here for Herb, <laughs> so um, I thought I don't, was being taken. I, I don't know. I just oh. I approved it because it was oh, just great. a general discussion. Oh, okay. But I just again, the only person of the three of you that you and I did have a discussion about okay. pilot versus okay. assessors, and and you did yes, you yes, did yes. reference Gene. And, yes, and, yes, yes. Sure. Okay. So. so good. Okay. So now that's connecting dots for me. So Dylan, um, let me back up. So in this all started with the collection of revenues, outstanding revenues, and sort of looking across our assessments and saying, hey, why are some of these solar contracts so um, behind? Mm -hmm. And so um, we pulled a small working team together and um, leveraged sort of the information that Jean had around the actual pilot agreements, around some of the lease agreements. Laura was brought in on the discussion to share contracts. Um, and then of course we, as the treasure collector uh, team, we kind of looked across and said, okay, well, all of these bills are outstanding. Are we supposed to be billing? Are we so that's supposed what you mean be by behind yeah. is that it Thank looks you. like there's yes. Okay. So there, yeah. So there's some outstanding receivables as it relates to the contracts. Um, that being said, Dylan is an amazing resource for some of the um, the efforts around solar and uh, cannabis, as you're going to see the marijuana host agreement. So one of the things that we discovered was not only um, are there different best practices out there around future contracts that we can leverage and. Gene and I have talked about this before too. Um, one of the, the things that we understood is 
these companies change hands very, very, very quickly. And so there's a lot of turnover um, around these particular leases, if you will. And so part of being um, sort of ahead of the game in, in the contract stage is to make sure that we start looking at opportunities to build in, you know, clauses as it relates to changes in ownership. Because one of the most challenging things is a lot of these companies are out in the Western United States. Um, and again, they turn over so quickly that it makes it very difficult to kind of track who belong, who does this bill even belong to, right? So um, that, that's what I can say from the collection side in one of the efforts that we've tried to make um, and pulled the team together to sort of dig through all the parts and pieces. And then um, I know Dylan's done a lot of research to try to track down some of these things and look at the contracts. Uh, you've been working on it for like a year, right, Dylan? Um, we sat down a long time ago and just said, okay, here's all the outstanding accounts. Um, and we've really narrowed it down to five key contracts, really. Um, and there's, I think, at this point, about three outstanding. Um, and it makes up, I would say, around $100,000 in receivables. Um, and it's on the personal property side, which is a little tricky because you can't necessarily um, go after personal properties, these are a little different because they are contracts, um, but not like you could go after on the real estate step, on the real estate side of things through mass general law. We're protected um, a little bit through the contract or a decent amount through the contract, but right now we're not, we're not at that point. Um, we're really just in still a cleanup phase to be able to um, try to, you know, get paid on, on our billing. So. So you said there's three outstanding and a hundred thousand dollars. May I ask where you started before you did all this work? How many? You know what? Um, we have I'm trying to remember. So there's really the five, um, all the BWC contracts. So there's Gene probably knows them in her sleep, but um, this is Blue Box Ray, Pond, right? Muddy Brook, um, Bubbling Brook. <laughs> like there's it's, uh, Box Pond, BWC Box, Box Pond, Pond, Muddy right. Brook, Wading oh, yeah. River, so, Mystic Solar, Mystic River. Mystic River. River. Mystic River, yep. So Dylan knows as well. Um, and we have made collections on it. Um, I would say maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, and so, you know, some of them, it's not that people are like, unwilling to pay it's more that we're we have to track these people down because we just don't have current data on them and even if it, it were it's like i just want to talk to somebody who can point me in another direction and kind of chase it down so i think i was just actually telling gene um that we uh got a contact today we were like yes with um muddy brook and there's two people that we just sent statements to and that's about forty thousand dollars so we're chasing that and making sure that we can um collect on those so there's we were under the impression that they were just going to be making these payments and they don't they well, well bill or? a lot of that goes to the way they had to be handled in the past and the good news is a couple of years ago that law changed so prior to that change the Department of Revenue made us take that pilot agreement and convert it into personal property tax. And at the time you're doing the conversion, you don't have the tax rate and you don't have your values set. So you're guessing. So it's a guessing game, the number best one. Guess. <laughs> so of course I always guess high because I don't want to underestimate. And then when the bills come, or when I before the bills come out, but then I know what the tax rate and the values are. Then I have the process abatements to get it down to that exact amount. As of two years ago, and I didn't like that, and I had arguments with the Department of Revenue all the time because it also became part of your new growth. Bad mistake. But new, you mean an existing? An existing pilot because it became new personal property, which then got added to the levy. And I But it came off the on the other side, though. That doesn't make sense. Because it's no longer a pilot, right? I mean, in other words, it's not really new money because we were collecting it before. Well, when they first, no, no, when they first, it's always been a personal property. Okay. From the day that contract, from the day the solar field went into operation yep. and yep. I started charging, it was always personal property. But that first year, it became new growth, okay. which raised your levy. Yeah. You, d you should never have in new growth something that's temporary. Because once those fields shut down, your levy doesn't go down. Oh, I see. So everything else in town's got to pick up that balance. So they finally, two years ago, and I'm sure it wasn't just my just efforts, but a lot of efforts. No, I stood up at meetings and they said, oh God, here she comes again. You know? They finally changed it. So now all pilot agreements will be coming in as receipts, 
no longer part of the levy. Oh. There'll be a receipt. Also, the law changed. It said any new negotiations of solar programs, including renewals, the Board of Assessors has to be involved in the now, negotiations. What about the existing ones? They've already been negotiated. But if you do renewals on any existing ones, then the Board of Assessors has to be so, brought in. But the ones that are in there right now mm -hmm. are in the levy. Right. So when they any existing contract stays the way it is, so we still have to calculate every year what that personal property now, bill is going to be. When is it that when does that come off of the levy? When they shut down or just oh, when it's renegotiated? It doesn't come off of the levy. That's the problem. No, but well, I guess when does the how do I ask this? Because at some point that revenue could stop. Right. Right. So my question is if if it's a contract that's renegotiated, does it does it somehow um turn into personal property or, or turn into turn into revenue versus levy hopefully there should be some way of if they continue to renegotiate that contract under the new terms but it's still in the levy but it's still in the levy it's still in the levy so, the only way to get that levy underwrite. down is to do an underwrite right. but i know of no community in massachusetts that ever well, spent no, success no. Yeah, but how does that how does that affect two and a half it's it in doesn't the levy. it's in the it's levy it's right? in the levy Unless you take it out, and unless you run an underwrite, you'd, the have, value to, of the you'd have to do an underwrite right. to bring it down. But again, no one ever does that. No, no, but I think no, no, no. Really, but yeah, but yeah, we we have that option. I just want to under yeah. I just want to understand right. the mechanism. Right. That's all. Right. Usually, okay. it gets lost someplace, and I get yeah. and it goes out onto the everybody else to make that up. Yeah, right. I think uh, I was just going to say two other points that I guess that, since we're talking about this, that I'd like to make is <laughs> it just um, it's reinforced just for our team internally that it's so important for all players um, to be part of the process. So right from the person sitting at the table drafting the contract, our town planner, Dylan, has been on the ground and just understanding sort of the lay of the land as it becomes best practices um, around certain host agreements and such as we're learning. Um, but obviously the assessor has a huge role in it. We have a role in collections. and everybody's sort of looking at all the pieces like I'd never seen a solo contract because I just wasn't privy to that information and when I'm scrubbing receivables I I'm like this this doesn't make any sense where where did this come from what are the terms what and so we really had to say so then we pulled all the pieces together I'm like gosh I wish I knew this you know a year right, ago right, or two years yeah. ago and Jean's like oh no we have to do this and we have to do that I'm like thank you well this is well, so this is all really like, unique to a municipality you know, Very much so, so it's not That's, something that yeah. you wouldn't know until yep. you actually started the job. Yeah, no, right? and it's it's been great. Um, it, it's been great because we've all been able to sort of chase a different part of it and ha get some results quicker. But I think is, bottom line of the collectibles yeah. was the change in ownership. No one notified yeah. us that there was a new company. I continued to send out those tax bills each year to whoever was in that right. contract. And I don't know, maybe they were throwing the bills away, but they certainly weren't calling and saying, well, we no longer own this company. Right. Stop Closed sending us shop. a bill. Who knows? Yeah. Who so, as Jody said, ownership. verbiage has to be put in those contracts. Going should have been, well, shouldn't have been the uh, utility, shouldn't the Department of Utilities been notified? Could, don't they regulate it? The Commonwealth, they or those connected solutions? Or? So they don't care about the municipality. No, I, well, but, the, but yeah. to answer your question, I'm pretty sure connected solutions or <laughs> the, you know, the, the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts probably needed to be notified they just didn't pass it on to anybody right i don't know dylan do you know well we have it now i mean that's the important thing is that we have tracked everyone down we know all the owners at this point and, and i think i think we, we we flag these five contracts had i known there were five contracts it wouldn't just be like i mean those are big sums so forty nine thousand dollars is going to stand out but what's nice about what we know now is that if we scrub things after a quarter and we s notice this this and this is outstanding receivables right. you go after it right away mm -hmm. because there's usually an issue now did you lose any of the previous years because you weren't aware of this so you mm -hmm. can go back in time oh sure. And collect all oh, it's, yep. it's, and we have yep. And there's like I said, there's there's one that has a larger balance than others, but the others I think will be successful collecting. So. so what I like about is what I see is the collaboration across departments mm -hmm. to solve a problem. Right. So that's good. And I'm still trying to I'm just compartmentalizing now. It sounds like we've got a, an immediate issue of collecting on past receivables, which we've got a beat on. Mm -hmm. Right. We understand who all the uh, current um, lessees are dylan right so we all what i haven't heard is how do we stay on top of it going forward more specifically the contracts right mm -hmm. that's one thing 
So how gets back to how do we understand when there is, I would think if they have a contract that the municipality would have to be notified. If they have a, a contract with the municipality and they go out of business, they sell their stake, we probably were notified. So we just want to kind of plug that leak. I'm saying it could have been a, a an innocuous say, letter Dylan that can came. probably I, speak I, to a lot of this. She scrubbed all the contracts and spent a lot of time. So maybe Dylan, you yeah. can yeah, no, just that. Real, that's, that's oh, one thing no, but I'm sorry. Sol for. And the other thing would be planning for an underwrite because I do think if ever this, we need to have that from a from a budget standpoint. If we know somebody, a revenue source like this, it's going to be ending. But it's, it, I mean, it's isn't the contract thirty years? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the first one was twenty five that we did. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's a long time. But I would, again, just just because I've I, I I remember having this conversation at one point. The big difference is pilot, you know, payment in lieu of taxes. That's correct. Right. So it was not. Um, you know, if it's personal property, you you know that you you can track the ownership because you're notified. But but when this kind of a thing changes, it's it, it that's probably why it fell through the cracks, right? Because there is no mechanism. That's why I think it was the department of uh, the the department of energy or, or or whoever that was tracking it that wasn't passing it on. And Dylan, I, I guess I'm wondering, are there any other projects? Anybody else interested in adding more solar in Menden that we're not aware of right now that not that I've seen. Um, I don't think I've heard any questions about solar recently, so I'm not sure if there's any new ones coming in. But they also just passed a law too about chapter lands, because in the past, if a farm had wanted to put some solar fields, and we've had that happen with Varney. Sure. They had to withdraw that property from chapter pay a rollback tax, then the property got assessed for solar. In order to keep farms now, if they do elevated solar, but still have their vegetables or fruits or whatever growing underneath, they can still keep it under chapter now, which is interesting. How, how do you how do you grow vegetables when you don't get any sun on them anymore because the solar panels? I mean, are... there's some way I'm sure they can do it. <coughs> that that sounds like a boondoggle to me. I don't know. I, don't I, don't know. Know. I think it's I think it's over the greenhouses more than over the fields, right? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but even a greenhouse. I know. I don't know. Still, still I don't know how they're doing it. it. Right. <laughs> that sounds crazy. magic. I don't know. That sounds pretty creative. You know. Um, anything else? on solar agreements? Uh, just let me know when you, because I still haven't gotten any information about who the new owners of those companies are. Yep, I can okay, give it to you. you. Great, thank you. It just, I mean, I, so the, the receivables I understand, but I think, I do think we should close the loop on how do we try to stay on top of current owners so we don't fall in the rears again. So I, I don't know, know I, I get, I I get the impression that once, that once she knows who it is, She'll find them. Uh, oh yeah. Well, but but if if somebody were to, I'm just saying this dynamic could happen again. So just yeah. a thought. I'd be looking for some ideas and how yeah. we avoid it in the future. Yeah. Is there a registry I mean, somewhere or something well, that I was we can? Say, I mean, if we know if we know what we need to be collecting, mm -hmm. it's it's in our system. So it's it's yeah. reports that we run anyway now um, on receivables, and I think. You know, with regards to these five contracts, if we know we need to get paid X amount. And we know how that revenue is accounted for. We just need to see that we've received it. It's just yeah, communication. Exactly. Absolutely. The, the other thing too is yeah. if we have to renew contracts, we get new contracts. I'd be curious. I thought I heard something earlier about um, wording and adding things to our contracts. Adding the Absolutely. wording that there's some kind of penalty if they do it's, not. It's, my, my one problem with that is it's always difficult to put a penalty on a company that goes under. Um, if they disappear, the penalties sort of moot at that point. Is that what's happened? Is they're going under, or is it just that they're selling? Out? They get they get they get sold. They get bought. Uh, but we haven't had that issue of a company disappearing on us. They they've just been bought or changed names. So it hasn't been horribly difficult to find them. It was just that no one was looking for them, so we didn't find them. So I'm just curious where where was the information about it changing hands? Was it secretary? I emailed the, the old oh. owner. Let's just call the old owner and said, who'd you sell it to? Yeah, who'd you sell it to? Any any type of research to try to track track right. it down. Yeah. And there was yeah. no requirement for them to notify 
I, I don't know. I, so I guess I would say this. If we have a renewal or if we have a new contract, yes. I would expect yep. a fairly collaborative approach yes. to kind of <laughs> compile I'd also be, yeah. now into that. See, I, I, would just okay, think that, I would just think that National Grid would know because they're all tied into mm -hmm. the grid. And I know we have a 99-year lease, I think it is, or there's some kind of an agreement, you know, a, you know, down on Route 16. I know that particular piece you know, there was an easement that we had to grant to National Grid in perpetuity to get access to it. So the point is, they're the ones that are paying this company for the solar that mm -hmm. they're providing. So if they have to change hands that, all right, we're not paying this company, pay we're paying this company instead, there should be a requirement that they also have to let the town know. Well, I don't think the utility companies are quick to... Help the I, but they have they have the information. I I don't have any yeah, fear that in the future we'll have this issue again yeah. because we can get the information. It's just we don't want to go years without looking for the information. Well, I agree. Yeah. So I I'm not worried that we'll lose track of any of them and that you know we'll have some solar field and there's no way to find the owner. There will always be a way to find the owner, but we do need to focus on making sure that if the owner does change. We're quick on that, and we make sure we get that information from them. Okay. So I think these. I trust these, Dylan. She yeah. says it will not be a problem. So oh, if yeah. you have a problem, Dylan. Uh, it's on me. <laughs> right. You're, you'll be on the agenda again. I'll take it. Right. <laughs> See, I wasn't even aware those bills were not being paid until right. Jerry said something to me, and I went, "What? Yeah. What do you mean they're not being paid? Right. You know, it's yeah. So it's again, this is. There's a lot more communicate. We're getting there. We're we're getting. I mean, David's having tomorrow. I'll be at the, yep. the meeting. I mean, the meetings are great. You know, we can talk to each other. Yeah. Them, but you know, it's a missing piece. Certain departments have to understand the things they do impact other departments. Sure. And if we don't know they're happening. Sure. How about uh, let's move on to 15 then, marijuana host agreements. I, I think, think this one's me. This right do we know why this, David? Do we know why this, I think this is put me. on here? Okay. I thought Dylan had requested that. Am I no? All right. I did not I request thought, it, but I was oh, told to be here. Moving on. I'm oh, here. All right. Okay. I, here, I can I can Maybe speak the, to it. Yeah, Dylan, why don't you just give us an update? Yeah, on yeah. It's it's a very it's very short. Um, so I went to a webinar with the MMA. Um discussing the new regulatory requirements that are coming into effect this spring. Um, this might affect our current host agreements if our current host agreements are not in compliance with the new regulations. So we may need to work rework the agreements, but I want to have town council look at the new regulations and look at our host agreements and ensure that we aren't missing anything. Do you know I'm what not a lawyer, so I don't want to. It's a, a lot of um, equity, um, how things are advertised before a marijuana place goes in, um, how they pay the town. It's small things, but if we're not in compliance, then uh, they can, we can get in trouble. Yeah. So in other words, something like charging too much or making unfair. Yeah. I mean, un unfair, unfair agreements. Asks up front or, or requiring them. To exactly. Mm -hmm. So it, it's worth us looking into this now because it's going to go into effect this spring. I'm not sure the exact date, but if we can get town council to do that I had a and go through, we look fully engaged. Well, no, I'm I didn't drive like go to the actual physical building. Jen, can you can you? Oh, I thought someone was saying. No, something. she just wasn't muted. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. My, yeah. My, that that was my because I I know I did have a, a conversation with with someone about this. And I don't think that that this town puts some unreasonable requirements on people like yeah. uh, businesses. Like a, I actually have a have a, a friend whose family has a, a few of these, and has uh, one of the comments that I did, one of the things I didn't realize that affects all of the cannabis shops is because it's not federally legal, all of their revenue um, is taxable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in other words. They can't deduct any costs federally because it's not legal. So all the cost of growing and packaging and all of those expenses that you would normally, when you do a Schedule C for business, they can't deduct any of that. Um, which, you know, and, and of course, why would the government be in a hurry 
to change that mm -hmm. because it would really significantly reduce the revenue that they and collect they don't from don't want it. them exporting, so they're not going to get into the Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Dylan, um, how many current agreements do we have and how many are still waiting to get up online? Three. It's three or four. Yeah, three. And one just came online recently, right? Like in the last yes. month. Yeah, JDM. JDM, DJM, JD. DJM, yeah. That one. And we'll be picking up. Yeah, they have different. Oh, my goodness, that was they crazy. switch their initials around for everything. So it's really. Oh my goodness, we're like crazy. It was JDM. This one had JDM. I had DJM, DJM and I'm going. Well, who's DJM. got it right? We found out that they were both right, but they have different LLCs. And I'm like, oh, this is this yeah. is going to be interesting. <laughs> we'll okay. be picking up their personal yeah. property this year also. So, yeah. so my my one ask is just um, if we can have town council look at that. Um, if it's right for me to contact her and, and ask her to do that, or if David should be doing that. Um, David, if you can, he, he actually has a couple of other things he's reached, had to reach out to her about, so. I can do that. Great, I actually you. had contacted her today about another issue, so I'm hoping I'm gonna get a call from her tomorrow. Great. All right. Uh, Dylan that? wants to be part of that, no? The discussion uh, or yeah, yeah. I, I totally can be. Just let me know. All right, is there is there anybody on about the uh the update on the carriage house demo delay? If not, I can certainly fill everybody in that there's a, a hearing scheduled for I think it's the 29th, I believe. 25th. The 25th. Okay. So, so Dan, what what can you tell us that, if, if I'm not mistaken, right right now the carriage house, um, there is there a requirement for us to do this demo, um, delay hearing, or what was there not because of the way that the the bylaws worded. So uh, the way the bylaws worded so. A literal interpretation of the bylaw would not apply to this building. I think it was a little bit of ambiguity, and I think the commission felt the best course of action was to play it safe, hold a hearing. It's not hurting anything. Um, you know, I think we're all aware of the, the building commissioner's memo, and if it turns out the building is a hazard and has to come down tomorrow, then it is what it is. But otherwise, we should do our best to try and follow the process and see it through. What I wanted to what what I wanted to 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 point out or offer is that the uh, building inspector said to me that based on his assessment, there is nothing on the existing building that is salvageable. It is so um, deteriorated that it has any kind of you know preservation would involve reconstructing what exists. Where is that? It's the carriage house behind behind the library, the old St. Michael's. Um, and what I was going to offer, um, I do have a, a Faro 3D terrestrial scanner. It's a laser scanner. And I could do a scan of the building. I don't know if I can get behind it easily, but I could actually do a scan outside. And actually, if it's safe enough, I could actually set it up and scan it inside. And I would get a, a very detailed digital rendering of the building. So if for some reason someone ever wanted to recreate it, um, as much as what if if it if it is intact, I haven't seen it in a long time. I know there's there's plywood on the front of it to to board it all up. But you know, I mean, we could just take photographs. But you know, a digital a, a digital scan is very useful for architectural drawings and all kinds of things. I would offer that if the if the historical commission felt that they they wanted that um, if it if it's still standing. But I think it's it's made it so far. So um, and anything I'll else you want to pass add? it along? No, I'll pass that along. I mean, I think unfortunately the time to save this building was probably 2016 when we bought the property, but. It is what it is. It's unfortunate. I, you know, I would agree with you on the condition. It's pretty bad. All right. So the so the plan is for you to have the meeting, and then at our next meeting, we'll. Well, actually, according to the uh, so, according to the to the building inspector, um, 
he, he doesn't he doesn't didn't really want to wait. Um, and I did speak with the uh, I did speak with the highway surveyor and he said if we uh, if the board directs him to he said his staff um, can go up there with a backhoe, take it down and put it in a dumpster and get rid of it. So he said we could actually do it internally. The fire department I do have one question. Sorry. No, no, I don't even want to. Yeah, no, I don't even want to. The, the short answer, if you ask them, yes, they'll probably say yes. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but it's too close. Have you ever, have you ever been? At, I, I actually. I don't think so. Well, I was at one in Millville. Oh, a burn. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And okay. I, I don't know. I don't think it's. Nope. <laughs> What's that? Dan yeah. Sure. Go ahead, Dan. Um, I just would add, it may be worth doing an assessment um, regarding uh, the floor tiles in that garage. Um, yeah, it's already there, already been. It. Yeah, it's already unless been, it's been done. Yeah, the the, the uh, building um, inspector is taking care of it. We've already discussed that. Yeah. Oh, good, perfect. And I would just add, so due to its proximity to the the well for that building, we do need to be extremely careful that nothing impacts that well. Um, it yeah, could be fine, sure. but it just anybody that does work needs to be aware. I, I thought we just I thought the the discussion at least maybe he discussed it with somebody that because we were leaving the foundation in place that it that was an issue was far enough away. And if we just take it down and don't take if we're not going to take out the foundation, um, then there's nothing else that needs to be of concern. Is that true or not? Because you know you're on the water board when, the admin for the water so, board. So. DEP, um, they had asked those questions. I never, I know we talked on the phone the other week. I never got uh, more an answer. So now you have, if you have more information if the foundation's staying, I can go back and check with them. I don't think they were overly concerned. They just wanted to make sure that everyone was on the same page, that they knew it was there, et cetera. There's no, there's no plan to remove the foundation. The, and the building inspector okay. indicated that there was no, there's no hazard to leave it. Um, it's just the idea is to take the structure down so it's not a hazard to fall on anybody. Got it. So. Yeah, that should be fine. I'll double check, but. So I'm not clear. Are we, uh, are we taking action on this now or are we waiting? For no, the plan. Well, the, to, the short answer is that the building inspector, it's within his authority. Right, understood. To just, yeah. you know, he, he may go by tomorrow and say, you know what, it's coming down. Uh, but he felt that while it's boarded up, um, the risk is acceptable until to have the to, to, to follow through with the historical commission's wish to have the you know yeah, demolition I delay. I agree that it's a good plan to have the public hearing. Just yeah, I think it sets a good precedent, and we don't want to set the wrong precedent. Right. Yeah, agree. Completely agree. With that. So that's the so no, we're not going to do anything right now. It was just it was just on the agenda from our last meeting because last time. Right. It was on the, so so now we're all right. Thank you. For okay. Yep. All right. Uh, budget forecast for FY25. Thanks, Dan. Okay, seventh inning stretch. Here we go. <laughs> um, Brendan, I'm just going to present in teams, so I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, it sure. should let me in. Yeah, you and should be able to present. So, okay. So it's coming up now. Yep, there it goes. Perfect. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, just close out of this. Good. So yes, um, as the chair said, we are going to present um, the FY25 revenue forecast based on all the information that we have available to us to date. Um, our agenda today includes um, a quick intro of the finance team. Um, we're going to have a short discussion about the revenue sources. We'll go through FY25 estimates. Um, talk about how these revenue sources are distributed across our budget um, and then talk a little bit about um, next steps as it relates to our budget timeline. So the finance team, um, our interim town administrator, David Demanch, uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet him, um, has been a, a wealth of information across different communities. Um, and we are happy to have him help out in this area. Um, I'm the finance director, treasurer collector, Jody Kersey, um, and I coordinate the, the finance team um, for things like this. 
our town accountants, um, Eric Kinscherf and Sean Griffith, um, work for Eric Kinscherf CPAs, um, and they are a key key part of this team as well. Um, we have the benefit of having them have their eyes and ears across uh, the Commonwealth and some of the other communities that they also do work with. So it's great to have have their insight sort of on the to have the pulse on the municipal space. Um, and then, of course, our bench strength uh, here, the principal assessor, assessor Jean Berthold, um, is just a wealth of knowledge as well, um, is, has really uh, been able to contribute to um, a lot of these projections. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is our revenue sources, um, and I'm going to turn it over to Jean, and she's going to talk to you guys a little bit about that. I thought I was just doing the levy. Both. Oh, I'm doing both? Yep, that's what my notes say. <laughs> well, the biggest part, I thought you were doing the I'll do biggest part of our So yeah, so we have three three main revenue sources. Right. Actually, she's right, I'm wrong. Um, I jumped ahead. <laughs> so um, our three main revenue sources are the tax levy, local receipts, and state aid. Um, those three revenue streams really make up our um, the you revenue side nice of our budget. Bubble. Do you have that? Yep, and okay. that's coming up. Okay. So Jean is actually going to talk you through the first one of these revenue sources, which is the tax levy. The tax levy, and so there it is. For those of you that are in the room, um, I did go ahead and hand out this because it became pretty microscopic on the yeah, screen. Kind of cool. um, just for the benefit of everybody else, I'll kind of magnify this a tad to see if it helps. But um, she can take it over. From so we're utilizing about. the last year's only because it's completed. But this is what a levy limit uh, worksheet looks like every year. And this is on Gateway DLS website. These are all autofills. So all of these amounts go in by other forms being approved and created. So, uh, you know, let's just go back to love. Let's do a little history. So November of 1980, when we were all mere babies, well, not me, but <laughs> I don't even think Dan Byer was born, so. <laughs> I was in high school. You were in high school. The voters in Massachusetts voted to enact Proposition 2.5, and, and that was to put constraints on the budget because it was out of control, and that commenced in fiscal year 1982. So what the DOR did at that point is they said, okay, Menden, if you're spending $1,000 in FY81, we're going to put that 1000 in plus 2.5%, plus your new growth. So that, but initially when they did that, they only gave the town the following year what it spent. So there was no incentive for the towns not to spend up to the levy. And after a few years and they realized, hmm, we're, they stopped doing that and they just leave the levy, whether or not you tax up to it, you start the next year with that levy, which is good. So we start, so as you can see on the sheet, the first set of numbers, which is number one, A through F, is the previous year's levy limit. The second section, two, A through F, is what's happening in that year. So as you can see, the levy ceiling on the first one was the 18 million 313370. That's repeated on the second because that's, again, we didn't tax all the way up to that. I think there was only a few bucks left, but. We start with that again. Then, as you can see, Proposition two and a half, new growth gets added to that, and that's where you get your levy limit from of nineteen million oh eight oh six oh nine. Now, you're also going to see a number down there, F, it says levy ceiling. That's as far as you can go with overrides, and that half, that number also plays into Proposition two and a half, and that that number represents two and a half percent of the town's total valuation. And if you went there, it would be a $25 per thousand tax bill. So it all plays into that proposition to an So they limited even where a town could go because some towns could say, okay, we're just going to override, override, override. And we're not anywhere near our, our ceiling. So we're doing pretty good. So the next set of numbers is where the debt exclusions come in because they're not considered part of the levy. They, they're considered part of the maximum allowable levy, but they do not get factored into the next year because it's a temporary fix. And even if you hit that ceiling, you can still do debt exclusions. Okay. So again, that, that's how this works. So this year we're starting at that um, 
19080609 number plus proposition two and a half. And I've estimated the new growth a little bit higher this year at 250. Now, I've been criticized in the past about my estimates for new growth. They think I should be more realistic. Well, first of all, new growth is all over the map. I, as a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, the FinCom said, oh, you know, how come, you know, you're not doing averaging or what? And I gave them a 10 year new growth and it's like this sometimes. Hmm. So it's really hard to, and I like being conservative because that's an area where if we need something, you know, we don't know there's quirks in the budget sometimes until we go to set the tax rate. Certain monies don't come in, state aid can be different. So you need an area where you can take some money out of it. Like last year, let me see. Last year, okay. Last year I had estimated 220 as new growth. It actually came in 309.45 for a difference of 89,000. But you didn't wind up with that as excess levy. You only wound up with 65,000 because somewhere in that budget we needed to put a few more dollars. So it's good to have that. To me, it's good to be conservative. And in November, when you know what the excess is, you can raise it for something. Mm -hmm. But initially, I like to be conservative. So. so that's what the levy is all about. That's what we deal with every year. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any questions. Yes. Yeah, could you just walk through the differences between in, in uh, under the debt exclusions, B, C, D, and E? You know what I mean? You've got different types of you got stabilization fund override, so capital expenditure. Exclusion. Exclusion. What, what is that and how does that work? I think that's similar to a debt exclusion. Right. Maybe the wording's a little bit different, but it has to be used on either a piece of equipment or a building. It's a capital expense, right. or, you know, like if you're building a new school. So, so why, what's it, why do they call that out separately, do you think? I don't know why it's called out separately. Okay. And I don't even know what a stabilization yeah. fund override is. Eric, I guess. Excuse me, Eric. Can you, yeah, Eric? Can you um, enlighten us on those differences? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. All right. The differences between a debt exclusion and a capital exclusion is a debt exclusion is associated with the debt for a project. Right. So, say you have a project for a million dollars and you have to pay two hundred thousand a year, then you're allowed to exclude the two hundred thousand. So, it's associated with borrowing. A capital exclusion is just a one-time okay. effect on the tax rate, no borrowing. So you just, right. um, we want to buy a new ambulance or a fire truck. You say you vote a capital exclusion for 300000 you get to raise that levy for that one year only, and it, it's not associated for future years. So basically the debt exclusion is associated with debt, and the capital exclusion is associated with uh, capital purchase for the year um, that you're voting for. And can I ask that? When it says exclusion, that's exclusion from the pr from prop two and a half. Correct. As yes. G, like Gene, Gene went over the um, formula, you know, uh, prior levy times two and a half plus new growth. That's your levy limit. But the exceptions at the bottom allow a town to override that limit if the town voters vote it. So, so there are different levers we should be aware of as we think about different projects and or. Mm -hmm. Cap capital expenditures we're considering fair. That is fair. Like um, I don't want to steal Jody's thunder, but um, the, the debt exclusion is actually going to go down. The debt that's um, being raised from uh, prop two and a half. So I think it's going down from a million to like seven hundred thousand or something. Mm -hmm. So um, so the levy will go down as a whole. But that would be a good opportunity. Um, as Jody will indicate to do like a capital exclusion if you needed to. So and it won't affect it'll be a one time one time expense year. So basically if there was say there was four hundred thousand <laughs> dropping off of the of the debt, debt, you could continue the tax at the same level for one more year and you'd have that four hundred that that's yes. whatever that whatever that amount that was paying the debt that year could be used for a one time Correct. capital expense. <laughs> yep. two yep. more. I don't think we've ever had one since I've been here. No, well, I mean, it, I, I don't think we've ever. It's a tool that it can be way. exercised yeah. to yeah. keep your level debt service. Be good. Yep. Which is. Yep. Yeah, um, and we, we, we had the same situation was a treasurer collector, a dentist. 
Um, this was back in 1997, but um, we had the same situation as Menden is in. And do we utilize that tool to plug a couple holes for the year? Like the debt service was going to come down over two years. So they, they actually uh, voted an override. So we called it Proposition Zero because the tax levy didn't wow. increase because of debt, but we're able to fill that with different projects. So, Eric, just along the same ride, line, stabilization fund override and then water sewer were the other two I was kind of curious about? Yeah. This, you, you, uh, as a town, there's a section of the law that you could, if the town votes it, you could vote uh, an amount to go directly to the stabilization fund that would be an over and above the levy limit. So, like the town of Grafton, they actually created a road stabilization fund. So, they, I think they have like a million dollars that automatically goes over and above two and a half that goes into the road stabilization fund. So, that's like another tool. All these tools. Um, require the select board to put it on the ballot and the right. board is to vote it. So, so Eric, in the case of that, oh, I see we word override is that in perpetuity unless we do an, a stabilization underride to stop funding state. It's so we could use yes. it to a okay. prop two and a half override is just a, a prop two and a half override is forever, you know, right? Unless you do an underride, yeah, yeah, the stabilization fund override, override would just be a one time a one event, time. unless you repeat is that it. correct? Capital yeah. exclusion is a one-time event. Right. Okay. So in other words, right. if, if we decided that we wanted to increase the stabilization fund yeah. by a half a million dollars, we would vote that for a one-time charge in everybody's taxes. Yeah. And it would just happen that one year. I mean, we've always chosen to work it differently. You right. know, we've always chosen yeah, not to go to the people for everything. So we used free cash, things like that. As no, no, as, I understood, but it's right. important to understand the tools oh, in the yeah. toolbox. Right. Yeah. That's right. Right. And like the capital expenditure, that's when we created the capital expenditure so, stabilization account. Right. So think, yes. think about the idea. In You could say, we know there's $300,000 in, in debt coming off the books. Mm -hmm. We could do a stabilization override for that same dollar amount if we wanted to, just to beef up that one time account yeah. things like well, so there's there's I'm going to give you a good I'll give you a, a good well, I get my point is that's that's an example of these are tools at our disposal if you we should it, explore if we be need educated it. on them so that yeah. you know if how you can make recommendations yeah. we, we have issues but well, you know what that we we did something similar to that with an ambulance at one point mm -hmm. and we did it a different way if I, I didn't even know that tool existed <laughs> right now we have an issue coming up with growing costs with Police cruisers, mm -hmm. which are not capital, you know, they're they're consumable items, but you know the the um, you know the 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 premise that we right. came up with when we were funding those is no longer true when right. it comes to costs and expenditures. So this is something roll, a one-time adjustment we could do if we needed to. So part of me says this rolls into the capital planning effort overall. Overall, there there's more ways to fund some of these things and maybe we had thought about and based on timing and based on Jody, Gene, Eric weighing in, what is the best way right at this point in time in this budget cycle to fund some of these things? That's going to drive, is it a year one, year two, year five type of proposition? Right. That's why I'm curious. And whatever you do there would have to be voted at town meeting. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, any capital planning project has to be voted. Yeah. This is just de defining the method right. of right. funding, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. But the idea is before we go to the, the floor in town hall, right. to the town mm -hmm. meeting, you have a discuss it as your group, and then we go to the finance committee and sell it to them. So yeah. we get their buy-in. So I mean, well. if there's another way of doing it other than raising the taxes. But what we're talking about here is not right, specifically right. not raising the taxes. You, if you do it for the timing, right. you basically right, exactly. is just keeping it Constant service, right? Mm -hmm. Right. I get it? Yeah. I mean, because you I, never sell it anymore. Like I said to you taxes, the other day, don't ever but, use the language "we're not raising your taxes" because taxes go up every year anyway. Oh, oh sure. Because of cost sure. of living and things yeah. like that. Right. But you know, sometimes what you say to the public comes back and bites you. You know, like when they built the police station, Rich Schofield wanted to say to people, "And your taxes aren't going to go up because of it." Because again, it was replacing debt that was coming off. I said, don't do that because their bills are going to go up. Yeah, it well, may not be for that, but it'll be for well, something else. Usually, you know what usually happens when you say something like that is a, a few astute people ask the question and then you have to explain it and clarify it. And, mm -hmm. you, you know, he really wasn't wrong. He was just, you, it was just right. a, a 
it could have been a better way to explain it. But people which is what you were pointing out. Even, yeah, even right. debt exclusion, as we've talked about, you know, based on assessed value, that, you know, if you forecast it out 30 years, mm -hmm. the first year is accurate. It could change each subsequent year based on assessments, things like that. So, yeah, you need to have context and be nuanced in how you're making sure people understand these things and understood. Right. And, and just... And in a town like Mendon, where we don't have deep pockets or big fat accounts, I've always said tax up to your levy. It's better to incrementally raise right. that tax bill yep. than all of a sudden hit them. Because well, in 1980, amount. Mendon was a very conservative town, and the, yes. and the levy at that time, when they just threw on a two and a half collar, yes, that was, that was hard. To, everybody yes. around us had already had these bigger levies in place, so two That's and a half right. didn't impact them as well, mm -hmm. as much. And we had to dig out of that over. Right. Well, the okay. reality is, reality is that, you know, the idea of us um, not going up to the levy limit, the, the problem is every year we're always cutting somebody for something. We're cutting somewhere because we never have enough. But this year you didn't, you left $65,000 on the table. Yeah, that was, that was not, um, that, that was not intended to happen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know there's some people that aren't disappointed, but that that shouldn't have happened. No. I'm good. Thank you. What's the water sewer line? What's that? The water sewer line? The exclusion oh. for water sewer, Eric? Yeah. I, I've never had any experience with that specifically, so I, I'd only be guessing that it's all right for... Water and sewer projects, but I'm not sure. I'd have but to look that up. Override yeah. potentially. Yeah. Yeah, another thing we're not, you know, yeah. really involved in, where that price ticket would be <laughs> right. amazingly high. <laughs> right. but, but everything in that bottom section, Gene, is basically outside of the levy, and that's sort of the key point to take away. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Because mm -hmm. they're only supposed to be temporary. Any more questions on the levy right. limit before we move to the next revenue source? No. Okay. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Eric and talk through local receipts. Okay, so, um, all right, so I'm just going to put the this local receipts into a context. I mean, when we're uh, forecasting the revenue for the budget, we're looking at real estate taxes, local aid, and local receipts. And um, the tax levy is basically form, you know, you can't really, there's not that much flexibility in it. It is what it is. The state aid, it's the same thing. The state tells you what you're going to get and that's what you budget. So those two factors um, are, are pretty much known. But the local receipts, this is something that gets estimated by the town um, based upon um, different revenue sources. So basically, um, the taxes, like Gene said, um, they cover like 86 percent of the budget these receipts that we're looking at probably cover about 12 percent um the the biggest portion of these local receipts are the motor vehicle excise tax so every spring i don't know um gene would probably know when that first <laughs> <comes out. laughs> so um everybody's car gets taxed and so that's the biggest part of local receipts that's 1.1 million out of the 2.6 the other portion of which will bring us over like 50 percent is the charges for the solid waste um, fees the solid waste fees for six hundred fifty thousand dollars so that is put in the budget as a revenue source and the money for the contract is also in the regular general fund budget now too so they kind of offset each other so those are the biggest portion um the only increase that we have right now from last year to this year is the investment income and this is um because of the proactive money management of your treasurer collector uh, jody's done a great job um on investing the money as you can see that allows the town to go up uh 72 000 next year as a new revenue source and that is still conservative because like last year we um i think it was like 130 thousand. And some of it has, a lot of it has to do with joint money management, but also everybody knows that the short-term interest rates went up as well. But um, she's done a fantastic job on that. So 
we talk and we feel comfortable with that seventy-five thousand dollar estimate. Um, Eric, can I just, can I just interrupt you for, for just I don't I don't want to lose this point. You talked about trash fees and trash costs. You know the the revenue and also the expenditure is in the budget right now. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. So the discussion we had earlier this year, or even maybe last year with the Board of Health about building it into the taxes and making everybody um, take the ta and get rid of the tax bills. You can't. The, the separate the separate trash bills, um, because it's already in the budget, are we still precluded from doing that because it would increase, um, because it would increase over two and a half? Yeah, or because yeah. it's already in the budget, does it matter? You don't yeah, have that's that correct. 50000 to play with. I'm at, just, just answer, please, yes or no? Yes. Yeah, well, we, you, if, you could eliminate the trash fee and offer trash service for free, but you'd have to cut either 650000 from the other budgets or do a Prop 2 and F override for 650000 Okay. So what about the revenue side? Because you're already collecting the money. Um. Yeah, but it's but it's outside of the outside of the tax levy, right? No, it's not. It's the, the, the well, it's you're not getting taxed on it right now. There's not a real estate tax. No, but no, but, but they're sent. But my point is, they're paying a they're paying a trash bill. So that six fifty on that line item would go away. We'd reduce your your receipts by six hundred fifty thousand. Meanwhile, you're trying to pay for it some way. Yeah, so you'd have to add it into the, that's my you'd question. You'd have to add into a levy. My, my question is, because I know I'm going to get this question, so I just want the answer. So rather than sending separate trash bills, if we just added that into their tax bills, we would still have to do a two and a half override yes, absolutely. to do that. that. That's all, I'm, right. I'm just, absolutely. right. Okay, thanks. Yep. Yep. Per, yep. One thing, real quick, as you go through these, if there's a wash, meaning like the the the, the uh, so people might look at this and say, "Hey, we've got 2.7 in estimated receipts out there," but six, it's a wash because six six fifty is a wash with the other side of the ledger, <coughs> whereas some are true receipts that have some motor vehicle is the big yeah. yeah. So I'm just saying, as you go through this, Eric, maybe just kind of highlight or point out which ones are just going to be a wash net zero because the on the other side of the ledger. There's an offset. Does yeah. that make sense? Well, yes and no. We're not we're not quite there yet. The trash is an example that we can say that for. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, but, but things like department revenue, rev recreation. I'm assuming that's a, is that just the fees they take in to run their yes. programs? Yes. So, so my, it's a, it's a net zero impact. Is my point. Does that make sense? Well, um, I understand what you're saying, but it's there's not there's not a one to one. Yeah. Yeah. You, you might collect six thousand recreation fees, but I don't know what the recreation, the recreation budget yeah. is. No, it's no. more than six thousand. Let's not all talk over each other. What were you saying, Eric? Um, what I'm saying, like as far as the trash is pretty easy because um Jody and I looked at that today and the budget's about six fifty and we estimate about six fifty. So that's kind of a wash. Some of these other fees, I'm not sure. Um maybe like the ambulance service, the charges of service for ambulance. Um, that's a portion of like the fire department budget, so it's not a one for one. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's counted. But to answer your question, that's probably it for the direct one offs. Mm -hmm. um, as, as far as these local receipts go, I figures I used the solid waste as an example because that was a, a one off, but the other ones really are not. Uh, but the ambulance fee does go towards a portion of the. Um, Fight upon my budget. That's the theory behind it, anyway. I mean, we don't look at those other lines as what does it cost the town to actually do all of that, like motor vehicle. We don't say, well, how much of the assessor's time is used for it. And how much yeah, I guess what my point: there are certain receipts that are spoken for, right? If you will, trash, yeah. right? Or even the the recreation. That six thousand is is it's going to go towards programs. Now, whether or not they spend it all, I don't know. That could come back in free cash, right? Yeah. But there's certain line well, items there. That won't come back because it's, because it's in a it's in a revolving account. Well, that's 6,000. Is not, still on? No. The 6,000 should not be in a revolving account if it's. Right. So that's, that, I'm not sure what that is because right. he has yeah. the revolving, revolving accounts at the beach. Which yeah, I don't but, see. So, you know, right. Right. So that 6,000 right. must be someplace I, outside I got my of that. Question answered. Yeah, fine. So, okay. 
All right. So um, so so th that's kind of where we stand um, with that. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, just two other things. Um, if you're looking for miscellaneous revenue, um, the recurring part, the thirty-seven thousand, that's just a um, um, the like least. the bond bond premium on the bonds as like an offset, and then um, miscellaneous non-recurring thirty-eight thousand. That's for the, for the um, the intermunicipal agreement for the fire chief with Blackstone. That's they pay the town, and that's where that revenue goes into that miscellaneous non-recurring. So. Um, I think I think the miscellaneous recurring is also the solar lease. Yes, this, yeah, I think it was 7,000 for the solar Most lease. Most of that is the solar lease. Somebody for just 30 put their hand up, Jason did. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask why some of these numbers are very exact. It's 37,541, and then some are just 000. zero, zero. That's how are the these all estimates or some of them direct? Well, well, some of them be kind of new based upon the the, the contracts and stuff like that. The other ones are just at estimates. They just did just estimates. And the other thing, as far as like policies go in estimates, um, this is where the town generates some of its free cash because um, you try to estimate estimate conservatively. So if if the town estimates two point six and it collects two point eight. That two hundred thousand is what ends up in free cash. So, um, and you're not gonna, you're not really gonna generate free cash from state aid because that usually comes in. And the only way you generate free cash um, in the real estate is if um, you collect prior year taxes, you know, from previous years, like you collect back taxes. This is also a DOR policy. Because yep. they caught towns years ago, they caught towns using their estimated receipts to make their budgets and they weren't yep. bringing the receipts. So what they said at that point is, okay, give us your estimate from the year before, give us your estimate for this year. And if it's more than 10% difference, yeah. we want an explanation right. and we want supporting documentation. Yep. They're so you very were, happy yeah. when you underestimate because the DOR is pro free cash. They yep. want you. And since I've been here, this town has never cash. had negative free cash because we have been conservative. So, and that's, yeah. So the, we have to work with the DOR on this too. Yeah. Just a question on the, I think Eric, you said the non reoccurring was the intermunicipal agreement. Yeah. Yep. So is that still in effect for the next fiscal year, given that Chief it go, it's going away this? Yeah, so it ends in July, right? Is it going? Is it going away this July? Do we get one more year? I know I talked to the police chief about this a little bit. I don't know. We we assumed it was going to be FY twenty five, but if that's incorrect, we're going to have to change that estimate. We're going to have to drop it down. So I, I don't know. Yeah, the con well, the conversation I have with them was I we I don't remember if we actually are done this year or after the after this next fiscal year for this budget cycle but i do know that he did he does have the name of the person and it really is literally up to somebody yep. that because he was he did a very good job negotiating it and i actually i may be re I, I i really think it may be over because i was going to reach out to this particular individual to discuss it i'm just thinking we don't have a shared chief anymore right Right. Well, that. Well, that. No, I'm talking about. I'm not talking about. Oh, is that is fire that, chief? I'm talking about the dispatch. Oh, dispatch. Yeah. Because we have a dispatch yeah. with with Millville. So that's dispatch, not the. I I I. Is that dispatch, Eric? I'm, I, mean, I can't see it. I don't know. Yeah, I, I I thought this was for the um for the fire chief was. Did yeah. you share the fire chief with Blackstone? Yes. It well that very well could be. But what I'm talking about when we're talking about. I think dispatch goes up next. Not 25, but 26. We're going to get a charge. I thought. <coughs> or maybe 25. Maybe. Well, that stinks. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. I, I don't. I, I just so had. The, the, the I had a preliminary discussion right? with him about it, and I, I don't know. I, know sure. I did the receipts for years, and then when Jody came, I said, Jody. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, but there's, there's two items we got to follow up yep, on. Yeah, we're going to follow up on. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Oh. I'm working on dispatches, so you know, Mike is right about that. Um, I think we have one more year, but I have um, something into them. They're, de they're developing their budget now, and they're getting Thanks. the assessments, and they're going to be talking to the state. Once they talk to the state, I should have that number within 30, 30 to 60 days. 
if we have to pay we, anything this year, but I don't think we did. You talked about it. I asked them, or if so, you did. You did put in the request then. To yeah, I, I asked the MEC when we are coming online for the twenty five percent because it'll be twenty five percent, then seventy five percent, then yeah. uh, technically a hundred percent, but we're not paying a hundred percent because that whole Millville thing that uh, the chairman and I spoke about. We're good till year eight. We have a cap on it until year eight. Right. Well, if you can, like we discussed it, if you can give us another year, get us at least another year reprieve, that would be terrific. Yep, I don't know, hopefully in the next 30 days, they're working on their budget now, so. Perfect, thank you, thank you very no much. Yeah, and I do wanna mention like, this is a process, this is the kickoff process. The budget's very fluid. So as more information becomes available, we'll make the adjustments like, you know, as sure. we need them, so. This is why, this is why we always, always start with level service, right? That's right, yeah. Right. Yep. So, um, so that's all I have to say about local receipts. Um, any unless you have any receipts? questions. If if there's a way to cr pr create the, the, either this summer or whatever, and please send it to the FinCom chair if they don't if doesn't already have it. Yeah, I have um, a meeting scheduled with um, the chair tomorrow. Great. So Great. yeah, so we'll be able to run through it together. Perfect. Thanks. Sure. Okay, so state aid is our third and final um, revenue source, and Eric, you can talk through that. <coughs> sure. Um, this, it's only about 2% of the budget because um, usually in a town, the uh, the Chapter 70 money is usually a big part of it, but that goes directly to the regional school district. So um, the biggest part of that 579 is um, called unrestricted governmental aid, and that we level funded that. Um, last year we collected like 488000 and there's a couple other categories, like we get reimbursed for... Um, Veterans benefits, seven, we get reimbursed 75% uh, for that. And then there's, um, we get reimbursed for some of the exemptions that Gene's kind of aware of, like uh, the veterans and the elderly. So that basically is the um, the estimated receipts. And th those cherry sheet offsets, are, it's, um, the offsets are, there's money that comes in for the library that we can't use directly for the budget, it has to be used for libraries. So that comes into like a, a special revenue fund. But we had to level fund it. Um, if some of the select board members are going to the MMA uh, conference this week, I think the governor and lieutenant governor are gonna speak. And they usually um, come up in their speech, they usually give like initial indication of what the local aid is gonna be. But it's only 2% of Mendes revenue, so the consequences of the local aid is not going to be as drastic as it is for other towns, where other towns might have like 40% of their revenues as local aid, but Menden does not. Um, so that's it. So the local aid is pretty simple. Um, they tell us what they're going to give us We make sure we get it, and that's basically it. Yep. Any questions on state aid? So does, that, does that include Chapter 90 funds in the... No, no, it it does it does not. Um, the chapter ninety funds are called special revenue funds, and they only can be used for road projects. So I get, I hate to say off books, but it's off the main operating budget. It's accounted for differently. Okay. Was it a, was the chapter ninety money doubled this year? Because I know there were two pieces to it, right? I'm not sure. I am I, not sure. I, I believe I believe the email that came out was that they. They basically um, doubled it because it was additional piece, um, which is a good time for it to happen. And any of those reimbursements, like for exemptions and things like that, they have to be applied for. Right. Every year I have to apply for that. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's it for the local aid. And then um, I think the next side, slide is just basically just a recap that Jody put together. Um, that's showing the town's budget. You can see it predominantly. Um, it falls on the real estate and personal property tax pay is like 86% of the budget. You know, 11% is local receipts, what we discussed, and 2.3% is the state aid. So, so Jody gave me the small slices of pie and gave Gene the big slice of pie to talk about. <laughs> so that's it. Delegation. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so our total projected revenue for FY25 is $23,828,667. It represents a 2.23% increase year over year. 
Um, and of course, these numbers are not inclusive of CPA funding. Right, that's not any part of the levy. <laughs> so, sorry, before I moved on, was there any questions about, about the distribution of revenue? Okay, all right. Um, so just with regards to the rest of the budget calendar, um, we had put this out when we had started with the budget memos and soliciting departments for requests. Um, the capital asset plan is on here as well, but what I went ahead and did is sort of just italicized and grayed out the dates that have already passed so we can focus on the next, um, you know, three weeks, three to four weeks. We will be rep uh, compiling all of the department requests by end of month. Um, we have meetings all set up with each department head um, to discuss their budgets and really to um, vet them and make sure that you know they have things in the right lines. This is by no means a yes, no, it's in, it's out conversation. This is simply, are all your ducks in a row? And do you have any other things that you want to bring before FinCom and the select board. So David and I will be hosting those meetings. Um, and then beyond that, we will, there'll be um, select board and FinCom meetings, obviously that David will coordinate with you guys uh, to make sure that, you know, department um, budget reviews are done in front of you. And then we can make some in initial, um, initial projections. We'll kind of be working on those things behind the scenes once we see all the requests and look at line item over line item and variances and things like that that we can present back as the finance team for that. So that's really what we have for the next four to six weeks. Um, there, like Eric had mentioned, this is a fluid process um, and as more information comes available, we'll be able to better understand things on um, the expenditure side specifically, you know, the Maya will be making some announcements this weekend at the MMA conference. Um, the Worcester Regional Retirement System, their actuaries are going to be on site on February 6th. Um, but the regional assessments will actually be available at the end of the month um, on this on January 31st. So as we start to get this new information, we'll make updates um, and then there'll be an, a second revenue projection, um, you know, around early February to give you guys some additional information um, based on, you know, what we've learned from now until then. Um, let's see. So the only other thing that I thought would be helpful um, to share out and we can, these are live links here, but as we share the presentation, um, there's a, an, a great opportunity coming up. Um, it's an MMA webinar that I learned about um, through our, our human resource director actually, um, but there's an MMA Municipal Finance 101 um, seminar, Budget and Best Practices. It's a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. um, it's not it's not terribly long, um, but it's definitely beneficial to anybody listening online or for the board just to kind of understand all the parts and pieces and how they come together um, based on everybody's different levels of experience. I think resources are always good, especially those of us that like to you know, kind of seek out information um, on our own. These are great resources. And then certainly the Division of Local Services at mass.gov, they have a municipal finance training resource center. Um, you can learn anything from what's a tax levy to what's a levy ceiling, what's the difference between a levy and a levy ceiling, um, anything in between. Um, how are values assessed and sort of lots of different topics that can give you um, some rounded out information and education on topics as we continue to discuss them. Certainly reach out to um, anyone on the finance team, you know, at any point in time, we'll be happy to help, you know, answer questions, point you in the right direction. Um, and if you have questions along the way that we covered tonight or other things that pop up, I would encourage you to reach out as well. Anyone I, just any wanna, uh, oh. I, I just want to say it as a conclusion to this portion of the agenda, I want to thank the finance team for all their work in in uh, putting this together and making uh, the presentation to the board. They uh, they did a great job. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. very much. Appreciate it. You know how I love to put my two cents on a subject, <laughs> as it made me the most popular person in town. But awesome. something from before, I kind of question the legalities minus a bylaw or a charter of the present position of town administrator being able to appoint. 
something to think about. Mm. People in town, I don't believe they've ever agreed for you to give that power to anyone else. Well, Just my under thought. well, my understanding is under the under the existing under the existing mass laws, we can delegate. We were told we we as a board can vote to delegate authority, and well, I'm not going to argue it here. I mean, no, I, but yeah, I mean, right. you might want to check with DOR legal because there's also something called dereliction of duties. Sure, but I've that already discussed it. Very, I discussed yeah. it. I've okay. discussed it with two different two different town councils. So. I would discuss it with DOR legal. Thanks. That's where, and that's free, by the way. You can call DOR legal anytime you want. <laughs> that's yep. what I do. I've done it lots of times. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, discuss appointment of cap, uh, discuss appointment or um, creation of an ad hoc committee for capital planning. I think we discussed we're not going to we're not going to create an official committee and have to appoint people. We're going to do it ad hoc um, informally. Right. Yeah, I mean, the, the thinking here, this is something um, given timing. The idea is, can we get some folks together to support the finance team in the development of, of the of an initial plan, but also work to put process in place so that when the capital planning committee that is appointed comes on, probably for the next fiscal year, yeah, there, there's some policies and things in place to understand how it should work. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this group would not be would be very similar, I think, Brendan, to what you and Jason are doing with technology policy working group, yeah. where you've got folks together and you're kind of going through and going to put forth some recommendations for policy. Same idea here is we've got some folks Hopefully some folks from FinCom will um, be able to participate, but this is really a working group that hopefully can, you know, support Jody and team almost during the day. So I don't see a lot of meeting time here. I think this is about getting all the information that's been collected, yeah. put meat on the bone mm -hmm. so that then FinCom and this board can see something, not only what's being asked for, but a timeline along with potential funding sources, which, hey, I learned about new funding ways to fund today. So this is perfect timing. Um, but right now, I've got a couple of folks that have, have, have agreed to participate. Um, if anyone else, I mean, we don't want a quorum from the board. I'm going to do it if anyone wants to participate. Yeah, I would, I will, I'll also be on that because it's something I've done before. Yeah. But who else, who on the FinCon did? Uh, uh, waiting for names. I've spoken to the chair. Okay. <coughs> um, Great. So it's out there. I think time commitment and also maybe that is probably a challenge, yeah. is my guess. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, Mr. Sipley has agreed to work with us in Great. this. I think Dan Beyer uh, has also is willing to help out. And I, the thought being that Dan being on the conservation, uh, not conservation, uh, community preservation committee, mm -hmm. which is a potential funding source, mm -hmm. and also a member of the team, just the operational team, mm -hmm. would be a good uh, person to have look at and kind of weigh the, in on. What's the date? When, when do you want to have this established by? When do you want to have the first meeting? Um, Honestly, given what we talked about with highway, I'd like to do something next week. Okay. And it, even if it's just the four of us to start, I mean, we can add people on. This is a fluid working group. It's a fluid topic because I think the, we've got 72 uh, forms filled out, which is initial inventory assessment. It looks fairly comprehensive. Um, I can't imagine people aren't going to be asking for things through the budget process and or, oh, I forgot. Can we get this in? <laughs> So I think this would be a living, breathing framework up until we're ready to go to the, you know, finalize the budget. Do we want to shoot for uh, next week or the week? Do you want to do it next week or the week after? Because we've got two Wednesdays coming up. Um, well, this would be something I what I'd probably want to do is talk to Jody about availability. And if it's during the day, just to kind of figure out how would that first meeting work? And she and I can have that conversation and then we can look for available time, whether if during working hours works for people or early evening is better. We can, I think we'll have to just accommodate, but let me get back to you on that. But I would like to do something at a minimum, Jody and I talk next week, maybe this week, but yeah. next week. I'm just um, thinking that, that a week from week from today, the 24th, we don't, we don't have any meetings, you know, we don't have a meeting, but I know there's right. a, 
budget. Uh, there's some subcommittee stuff I, I have in the afternoon. So let me get back okay. to you. All I'll right. float some times and dates to the folks that have said they're willing to participate. Okay. We'll probably meet in that conference room on the first floor because I like that room. Yeah, yeah. it's great. So. Are, are we going to be putting together the capital plan through a uh, like a capital form where the forms are submitted by the individual departments and uh, then uh, reviewed by the ad hoc committee and established priorities for this year. For the, yeah, and, and Dave, it's it's see, so, um, I would have thought the inventory assessment is inventory, but I also see some asks within that because they're giving some projections. Yeah. We talked about this last meeting. I'm assuming the budget process. You're going to get asks that people made. To, if you're looking at it, Jody might say, right. "This is actually a capital request," right. and we'll funnel it through. <coughs> um, I see this group, though, David, is really supporting the finance finance team that puts going to put this plan together. I think we've got the framework from Jody and yourself. We just want to now look at it, and there'll be some level of of, of review and assessment of what makes sense. I think given timing, as you and I have talked about, David, we got a short window here to bring something, get it ready um, for, for, for uh, this budget cycle. Right. But coming out of it, to your point, there will be a process to find out how will departments look for capital requests? How will that integrate with the finance team, with the capital planning or capital improvement committee? So do yeah, you, you want to do it on a parallel track? Yeah, you know, both are happening at the same time. So you're able to establish a capital budget per se that'll be included as part of the operating budget. Right. And I think to your point, a capital budget is something we probably <clears throat> never really incorporated before in terms of calling that out. And I think that's something we're going to shoot to do even for FY25. You know, All as right. we look at what's out there. So right. that's the thought. And we just wanted to make sure you know, it's more considered more of an update and Mike and I will participate. So the rest of you cannot participate. I'm laying down the law now. Uh, <laughs> I think the law already exists. So <coughs> can't without posting. Can't can't without without posting so. <laughs> and what I would think is we probably just for the, for the board's perspective, probably get an update, you know, later in February on progress, mm -hmm. but keep that frequent mm -hmm. because every, it's all going to come together in the next 90 days. <laughs> no. All right, so, so you're going to get back to us yeah. about next week. Yeah. Okay. Um, considering authorizing the police chief or the designated assigned police details for elections, this is something I think there's a there was a a, a, a letter from uh, Ellen from Ellen right from the town clerk, just talking <coughs> about giving uh, you know allowing uh, the chief of police to assign details for these four different dates. Presidential primary, annual town election, state primary election, and state presidential election. So I just be looking for a motion. I move to authorize the police chief or his designee to assign the following police details for the 2024 calendar year elections: presidential primary, March 5th, 2024; annual town election, May 14th, 2024; state primary election, September 3rd, 2024; state presidential election, November 5th, 2024. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, All right, consider opening the ATM town warrant. I know it's amazing that we're already talking about doing it now, but the uh, the uh, it's coming May, fast. It is going to be May third <laughs> this year, so um, I'd be looking for a motion to open it with a closing date of uh, March fourteenth. I move to open the May 3rd, 2024 annual town meeting warrant today, January 17th, 2024. The warrant will close on March 14th, 2024 at 4 p.m. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Town administrative report. Uh, I don't have a heck of a lot, but uh, one thing is we're going to have a, a department head meeting tomorrow. Uh, we have a few things on the agenda. Um, Probably uh, the most uh, the the key thing is going to be talking about the budget, the budget cycle, um, as well as uh, a couple of the items that are not as uh, as uh, as big as as the the budget. Um, and and then open forum basically just an opportunity for everybody to get together and talk. Um, 
That's basically it. The, I was going to mention about the asset inventory that we actually have 70, I think it's 73 um, uh, results or responses from the department head, which I think is pretty uh, significant that everybody, you know, pulled it together and, and gave us, you know, basically what they have. And it's a good starting point. It's a baseline for the future. And finally, uh, I'm going to be talking to Labor Council about the town employees union and at least at a minimum getting the initial ground rules laid and, and developing some kind of proposals, uh, which I can't discuss now because it should be an executive session, but uh, talking to the board in an executive session over the next couple of weeks about what you know you see as uh, our bar hitting points and and pushing them forward for the new uh, town administrator. That's it. All right. Uh, having no other topics, um, I'd be looking a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great night, everybody. All right, good night. Good night. Good night. Jason, Travels. did you download the app for um, for the MMA conference? Have you seen that? Uh, I did download it, yes.